defense. And it was uh, as a um, civilian uh, that I was uh, uh, assigned to documents destruction. Uh, I started off as a librarian's aide, worked my way up to a military reference technician, and then uh, became a full-fledged uh, librarian for the Department of Defense. So uh, during that time, uh, I was exposed to many, many secrets uh, because the Presidio military base at which I worked was the uh, most important military base in the um, American constellation of bases outside of the Pentagon. Uh, we were the Western Defense Command Center. We were where the United Nations was established in uh, January 1st of 1941 as an organization of war. Uh, they're an organization of war uh, per Title 42 of the United Nations Charter in lieu of a uh, co um, constitution uh, because they're not a nation state, they're a supranational entity, a united front of nations. Uh, they are an organization of war uh, per Title 42 of the United Nations Charter, uh, united in their fight against uh, Hitlerism in the same sense that during one of the uh, first global wars, uh, what I call World War Zero, the Napoleonic conflicts, a uh, war was declared against the person of Napoleon Bonaparte as opposed to declaring war against France. Uh, the Allies trying to emphasize that they were attempting to liberate the people of France from the uh, the emperorship of Napoleon. Uh, so, too, they took that same approach with uh, Adolf Hitler in the Second World War. Uh, so it was only uh, two weeks and a few days after uh, the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7th of 1941, that on January 1st of 1942, the United Nations was to established on site the Presidio military base. It was also the site where the infamous executive order uh, 9066, 9066 was signed uh, into effect, which uh, led to the internment of over 127,000 Japanese Americans, as well as many other uh, German American and Italian American citizens of the United States uh, who were de deprived of their citizenship, um, declared enemy aliens, and uh, then at that point became prisoners of war on the North American continent, uh, entire families. And uh, so uh, they even went so far as to uh, try and human traffic them out of Crystal City, Texas. So the documents like this, among all too many others I destroyed, uh, many of these are exposed in a book written by myself and Peter Moon titled The Roswell Deception, uh, subtitled The Demystification of World War II. And um, so that's recommended to everyone to help put everything further into perspective. Um, and then it was after that I did serve a period of uh, time in the military, very short period of time, uh, did a lot of private security enforcement contracts after that, some mercenary contracts as what they would be termed in um, some cases. And uh, then of course spent a decade just taking care of my parents in their uh, last terminal decade of their life. Uh, and that's where I expended all the money that I had earned over the other two previous careers, sadly. And uh, as a result, um, when uh, my parents died, uh, being borderline homeless, I became a public informant. I had nothing to lose. Uh, there was no point in threatening my life because uh, literally I was uh, pretty close to starving to death anyway. Um, so as a public informant is when I became uh, uh, someone who tried my best to expose what I could uh, before suppression kicked in. Uh, of course, I was given only a limited exposure uh, before uh, the enemy. And believe me, my enemy is your enemy. And I don't mean just the enemy of the young lady I'm speaking to, Christine Joanna Hart, but uh, the enemy of every one of you out there listening. Uh, the, these are the people who want to prevent you from ever hearing the truth or understanding the context of uh, why we're where we're at now uh, in this horrible situation that the world has come to. Um, and of course, uh, I'll do my best to explain a part of that, a facet of that uh, through the course of today's interview, um, talking about the uh, Third Reich, uh, uh, the Nazis, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, the deep politics, the uh, the the arcane and the occult uh, that uh, is behind so much of uh, what has happened in history and what's happening now. Um, so uh, let it be understood that uh, I appreciate this opportunity 
uh, presented by uh, the lovely Christine Joanna Hart and uh, appreciate her dear friend and uh, the, the individual who's uh, working with HBO on this project. And let's hope we can present uh, enough of a prospectus where uh, they'll come back for more and, uh, and I'll be happy to consult. Um, that being said, okay. dear. Yeah, th thank you very much for that, Douglas. Thank you. Um, so would you like to um, go over your thoughts about the Nazis? And what I found it most interesting in uh, where I've heard you talk before is the occult um, connection with the Nazis and what they were up to and what World War II actually was. You said it was a fight between the um, anti-gods and the Norse gods. And what did you mean by that? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, understand, of course, that there's many uh, convergent uh, uh, cosmologies that are uh, confronting each other in an apocalypse that we're still involved with today. And uh, this apocalypse is ongoing now through the war in Ukraine, through the confrontation over the Taiwan Strait, and uh, we can only understand it through the context of World War II. Uh, and of course, obviously, there's history before the Second World War. But um, a lot of this has to do with what is a religious conflict, a millenarian conflict, uh, and that is often misunderstood. Uh, many people try to uh, turn this into something that is cheap and uh, and hackneyed and cliched, just a pastiche of uh, uh, accusing uh, the Nazis of being uh, the supreme and ultimately evil uh, power that is uh, satanic. And uh, this is something that, again, is simplistic, uh, childlike. And this is the kind of propaganda that has been fed to the Allies for generations. Now, uh, we take a look at Russia today, and they're still stuck in World War II. They're fighting World War II. They are stuck with the concept that there are Nazis in Europe that they're trying to uh, seek out and destroy. Uh, this is their official statement. This is their official objective. This isn't something that is uh, projected upon them. This is what they present to the world as the rationale for their atrocities. Uh, the somebody, Ameri somebody said to me um, yesterday, actually, um, that the um, Vietnam War was actually America fighting Russia and fighting communism. Is that true? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's um, it's one of those, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, um, uh, on the face of it, uh, one could... <clears throat> say yes to that but it really doesn't cover a topic that's that in depth or do it any justice at all uh just to put that in perspective so that people get a uh uh an understanding as briefly as possible and that of course is uh where the individual who i had to work with for many years i was assigned liaison to the satanic chaplain of all the um american armed forces not just for the u.s army but for all branches of military service, the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Coast Guard, etc. And that was, uh, at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino, who then uh, was forced to retire from the Army as a full colonel. Uh, he ultimately achieved that rank. And then he laterally transferred to the NSA, where he became a deputy director. Now, there's many deputy directors for such organizations or intelligence networks, just as there's many uh, deputy CEOs uh, for corporations. But uh, the fact that he attained such a rank, that's the federal equivalent in the bureaucratic sense uh, for it's equivalent to being a general in the army. So he attained a very high rank in uh, intelligence services, uh, despite the fact that he was uh, shrouded in scandal. Now, he was the individual who uh, was one of the original U.S. Army Special Forces Green Berets that became iconic in Vietnam. I mean, this is what John Wayne and uh, Sylvester Stallone were portraying in their films, were uh, Green Berets, Special Forces, and uh, this was uh, exactly what uh, um, Michael Aquino was. 
and uh, he specialized in psychological operations to win the hearts and minds of uh, uh, the population in Vietnam. And of course, uh, there was far more going on in Vietnam than simply a uh, stand against the communists uh, or the Soviets. Uh, the uh, obviously one thing that I can say is that most certainly uh, the Russians were much more welcome in Vietnam as allies than the communist Chinese. Uh, and the uh, communist Chinese were simply uh, united in the ideological sense, but uh, they were culturally hated by the Vietnamese. As a matter of fact, um, the one way to express this, uh, some of the, just so people understand, um, my mother was half Japanese, half Chinese. And I myself am a quarter Japanese and a quarter Chinese, uh, obviously, uh, as a result. And I was born in Taiwan, the Nationalist Republic of China, which was a Japanese colony uh, for over 100 years and very Japanese acculturated, very Japanized, uh, you might say. And uh, so I can speak to this with some level of authority. Uh, and what I can say is that uh, the Asians of the majority of East Asia will hate the Japanese as a nation and they hate the Chinese as a race. Now, this doesn't really bother the Chinese and the Japanese because they are the most powerful entities in Asia. But uh, the reason that they're hated is because they have a history of being so powerful. And then the other and Asian it, nations. Can I ask, is it because they're um, this dragon blood or something, the Chinese? It, there's an element of that in both cultures. There's an element of that in both cultures. Yes, uh, it, but um, then there's a uh, there, there's an element of dragon blood in Vietnam as well, and uh, uh, and most of the Far East Asian nations. Um, and and but, do, the, do the Americans not like that? Are they against that? Their spirituality is somehow against that. Believe it or not. Uh, the American uh, hatred uh, for the Japanese in particular was based on something else entirely, and it had to do with Christianity. And uh, this is part of the secret occult politics of the Nazis and why the Thaled Reich uh, under Adolf Hitler allied with the Japanese and at the same time with the Chinese, uh, supporting them both, something I'll do my best to explain. Uh, that was around the time of the Nanjing massacre. And um, my mother had a lot to do with Hitler having that level of understanding. Though he wasn't ignorant before he met my mother, who was very young at the time, but serving as a translator for the Japanese because she was a savant, uh, a, a very young prodigy who had a uh, talent for linguistics and could pick up languages uh, very quickly and very fluently. Uh, but when it comes to Vietnam, just to kind of finish that off that subject so we don't lose our thread of thought there, uh, it, when you take a look at the real economic reason for America's involvement in Vietnam, it involved the fact that there's only a few places in the world where it's suitable to produce the opium that uh, can be processed into high-grade heroin. So uh, the Golden Triangle of Southeast Asia, which is where Laos and uh, Vietnam and uh, China, even Burma and, and Thailand in the North all kind of converge in their borders and boundaries. It's that pivotal area, which is the, the most fertile area in the world for growing opium when people turn to that. And that's the true cash crop because it can be processed into heroin. And uh, so what the Americans had was uh, they had a Pepsi Cola bottling company uh, open up a plant in uh, Vientiane uh, in Laos, and uh, that's a city in Laos. And that was where they processed this opium into high-grade heroin. The, that was then shipped by Air America, the CIA airlines, to uh, the United States and distributed all over the world. Uh, this was a enormous cash crop for the United States, but it started with World War II. Uh, understand that uh, basically all of this started with the British Empire. The British Empire fought China, and uh, this was during the Opium Wars. 
And what did uh, the British fight the Chinese for? Well, the name of the war says it all for opium. And uh, what happened was the British demanded that the Chinese buy opium. And the Chinese said no. Now, it was one of my distant relations. My Chinese name is Lin Yiping. Lin is my surname. The surname comes first. So the family name Lin, uh, meaning like forest. Uh, it's a uh, name that is shared by many other Chinese. And one of my relations was Commissioner Lin, who was fighting the British. He was a police commissioner. But at that time, the Chinese were left with barely any standing army. So they had to count on their police forces to try and fight the enemy. And so Commissioner Lin rallied the police of China, tried to fight off the British, which was a much more trained and highly uh, armed uh, professional military force. Uh, ultimately, um, he lost militarily, was forced into exile because they would not tolerate his uh, war against corruption. And, uh, and at that point, the British gained control of the Chinese economy and forced everyone to buy opium. This is what uh, made the British Empire so fabulously wealthy um, at the time that the British were threatened with Nazi invasion uh, at the time uh, of the Battle of Britain, when Britain stood alone. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who unknown to most people, again, this is covered in the Roswell deception uh, and the demystification of World War Two. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, wanted to basically go to war against the British Empire. Uh, when when uh, FDR was the uh, assistant secretary of the Navy, uh, he was so eager to get combat experience because in those days, in order to be president of the United States, whereupon you were uh, commander in chief of American armed forces, it was deemed uh, that you had to have combat experience. You, you had to have military experience or you wouldn't be qualified to be commander in chief of the US Armed Forces. So in order to get that combat experience as the assistant secretary of the Navy, FDR personally led uh, the American e front in World War I. For those of you who don't know that World War I had an American front, it was Haiti or Haiti. Uh, and uh, the island of Haiti was declared to be a potential landing zone for the Germans. Uh, the, they were the first black republic in the world uh, and the second republic in the Western Hemisphere after the United States. They were always viewed as a rival uh, republic and an enemy republic by the very nature of the fact that they were a racial republic of free blacks. And uh, therefore, the Americans always seek to demolish Haiti or destroy it, uh, operate against it. Um, and uh, in World War I, they felt that if anyone had any reason to harbor the Germans or assets, uh, German U-boat bases or the like, it would be the Haitians uh, because the Americans had always been extremely racist towards them and did everything they could to oppress them. Uh, as a result, they invaded Haiti during World War I and uh, FDR was responsible for horrible atrocities. He personally uh, ordered the mass execution, the torture, the rape of uh, many Haitians. This was uh, originally when he was running against uh, uh, that individual who was uh, uh, the president of uh, the United States for a brief period of time. Um, let me take a moment here to look his name up. Uh, it wasn't Grover Cleveland. It was uh, uh, someone else that uh, was uh, president right after that invasion. Uh, he won uh, because uh, he was able to prove all of these atrocities that FDR had committed. So uh, when it came to FDR, um, he was someone who was not what people think <laughs> at all. Uh, he's not a person who was uh, some nice guy. He was an incredibly evil individual. Uh, and that's why Warren G. Harding, Warren Gamaliel Harding, was able to beat him when he ran against him as U.S. president by, and by the way, Warren Harding was a member of the KKK. And yet as a Klansman, he was completely uh, appalled by the atrocities committed by FDR. You see, Klansmen are heirs to the old Southern Confederacy. They look at blacks with a patronizing attitude. 
as like uh, stray children uh, to be taken back into um, a family structure, however perverse and and negative and, and traumatic we might consider that family structure to be today. Uh, so when someone like FDR was simply killing blacks for no reason uh, and uh, having no uh, no uh, means uh, towards an end, but killing them was simply the end itself. Uh, even someone like Warren Gamaliel Harding found that to be a crime against humanity. So he uh, he won the presidency uh, based on that. And then FDR decided he was going to take on the British Empire. One of the things he had done while he was the uh, uh, assistant secretary of the Navy was he drew up war plan crimson. So just so people understand this, the Americans had a rainbow code of war. And this was their step by step program to take over planet Earth. Now, this might sound absurd to Americans today, and the way they've been indoctrinated is completely insane. Americans uh, are told that the Americans had a rainbow war plan as a kind of defense that, oh, in case Japan attacked them, they had a plan. In case Italy attacked them, they had a plan. And each one of these countries was given a different code. Uh, Japan was war plan orange. Uh, the uh, Germans were war, war plan gray, I believe, but the British were war plan red. Since Canada was a dominion of the greater British Empire, that was war plan crimson, a subset of war plan red, but it was the most developed of all the war plans. And it was one in which uh, America planned to wage war against the Canadian population, essentially exterminate them, and repopulate Canada with Americans. Their idea of Lebensraum. This is all true. And all of this is something Americans can vet and verify and uh, validate for themselves. Don't take my word for it. Do your own research, look it up, and you'll find out everything I say is true. So what happened with FDR was that when he began to mobilize to invade Canada, he would have deprived the British monarchy of an escape route. The Canada was the most viable escape route for the British royal family in the event of a German invasion of the greater British islands. And uh, so the, in order to placate Roosevelt, they bought him off. One of the things the monarchy did was they put Churchill into office. Churchill, of course, is half American. Uh, his mother was uh, Jenny Churchill, a wealthy American. And like most wealthy British people of noble lineage, uh, they're asset rich, but they're cash poor. So the majority of British people, when they can, will try to marry preferably an American with a lot of money so that they can maintain their assets and in exchange the Americans get to marry into a noble lineage. And uh, so that was the arrangement with Jenny and uh, the mother of Winston Churchill. Uh, so the British made certain he got into power. And as someone who was half American, they felt he would be able to manipulate the madman, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, a murderous maniac. And uh, he did so. Uh, basically, what they did was they gave the Americans the opium trade. So what the British had won by force majeure, the vast opium trade of Asia, the Americans inherited. And that's what brought them into conflict with the Japanese. While the Americans were selling all of the opium to the Chinese, the Japanese were trying to interdict America's opium shipments. And this brought the Americans into direct conflict with the Japanese on the China front. So the Vietnam War was simply a continuation of those economics. The Vietnam War was a continuity of Americans processing uh, opium into high-grade heroin, a new phase of uh, narco-economics, and uh, distributing it all over the world as the new drug empire, uh, the successor state to the greater British narco-terrorist empire. Um, this is the reality behind the Vietnam War. This is the kind of cynicism that uh, must be applied uh, to history. But like all uh, 
like all things, uh, there is a limit to what can be considered healthy. We don't want to synthesize ourselves to the point of pathology. And uh, this is where people become pathologically skeptical. Uh, and it's a form of insanity. And uh, it leads them to not believing that which is obviously true and instead believing that which is obviously not. This is what the problem is with today's alternative media. And it's why I'm so hated in alternative media, uh, because I do tell the truth and everyone else is promoting a lie, mostly these days on behalf but, of the Russians. Could, could you explain um, Hitler's, um, you know, link spiritually with the Japanese and, and Chinese? Was it to do with this dragon energy that um, the Nazis also had? It's a very important question to bring up, and I thank you for that. It's a good segue. And it brings us into uh, Hitler's own personal um, intelligence and his own uh, encounters with my late and sainted mother. Um, he was a man who was influenced uh, by his own research. When Adolf Hitler was young and growing up um, impoverished, uh, and deciding that he was going to seek out a, a career in uh, art and uh, architecture. Uh, he was reading constantly in libraries. Now, long before he met his occult mentor, uh, you, Mr. Dietrich Eckhart, um, who was a incredible occultist who initiated Hitler into uh, the uh, occult lodges of Europe, uh, giving Hitler even more uh, arcane knowledge than he ever could have had access to before. When Hitler was uh, exploring libraries, he ran across a book on Tokugawa religion written by an Australian. Now, this book was translated into the German at some point, and it was there that Hitler began to understand and appreciate the culture of Japan. This heavily influenced him. One of the uh, many influences that uh, converged, um, understand that uh, there were, Adolf Hitler was uh, born and baptized a Roman Catholic. He never repudiated that religion. He was someone who remained until the day he died, nominally a Catholic. Uh, so he was someone who understood Catholicism. And at the same time, uh, there was the influence of the Bavarian Illuminati. Now, it was at the same time that America was born of these treasonous slave owners these uh, traitors to the crown, the uh, plantation-owning white male supremacists that Americans call the Founding Fathers. Now, I'm not presenting this in some politically correct and insulting way just to be uh, abusive. Uh, it needs to be understood that King George at the time of the Greater British Empire was, comparatively speaking, quite enlightened. He was so enlightened, so liberally progressive, that people called him insane. He simply thought in a manner that was too evolved for most people to comprehend. So he wrote the Royal Proclamation, and he said the original 13 colonies, he drew a line, and he said, this far and no farther, you are not to interfere in the lives of the Native American nations. They have their own confederacy. They have their own government and they trade peacefully with the French. Leave their territory to the French. And by God, you're an Atlantic maritime nation and you trade with England. You are part of our sphere of influence. And the Americans, however, wanted it all. They wanted endless, infinite expansion the expansion of slavery, the genocide of the Native Americans. And what they wanted was pure raw evil. George Washington was known in the language of the Mohawks as the village burner because he slaughtered 
hundreds of thousands of Native Americans burned entire collections of villages to the ground, ordered all the women and children running out of the tents to be butchered, even pregnant women to be gutted by bayonet. That was George Washington, a true atrocious, murderous psychopath. This was the father of the United States and his name still curses America's capital. The British fought to stop this. And it was the longest declared war in American history. Longer than World War II, if Americans accept the propaganda lie that World War II was 1941 to 1945, which it most definitively was not. But if you take that as a truth, then you understand that the American rebellion against the British Empire was eight years long, the longest declared war in American history. You can't compare Afghanistan and Iraq or any of those other struggles because they were not declared wars. So when it comes to that, the Americans then won what they wanted, so launched on a campaign of genocide and and slavery, the expansion thereof, which the founding fathers were all approving of because they were all slave owning plantationists. On the continent of Germany, they had established something to fight this. This was the Bavarian Illuminati. It was to fight against the Freemasons. The Freemasons had a war to undermine the Roman Catholic Church. The Bavarian Illuminati declared itself a revolutionary movement of perfectibilists, that was their term. And Adam Weishaupt and his perfectibilists were uh, as a facade, saying they were struggling against the church, uh, attempting to hijack Freemasonry. This was their intent to basically stop the Freemasonic insurgency in Europe. And ultimately, they went underground. The Bavarian Illuminati are the foundations for what became the Schutzstaffel, the SS. So when it came to Heinrich Himmler's SS, Adolf Hitler understood there were many Roman Catholic influences. He even referred to Heinrich Himmler as my Ignatius because much of their organization was based upon the Jesuits. They were a warrior monastic order, but of a new faith and there's two reasons that uh, they were formed. One, to fight the new kind of war, the kind of war the Americans fought. The Americans fought war as a campaign of extermination. The Americans fought everyone to the point where they would annihilate them all. The Americans did this with the Native Americans. The Americans did this when they invaded the Philippines during the Spanish-American War, where they were responsible for the largest genocide in history prior to the Holocaust. Three million Muslim Filipinos. They killed many hundreds of thousands of Roman Catholic Filipinos in the North, but they mass murdered millions of Muslims in the South. And for this, they earned the eternal hatred and enmity of Islam. And in fact, it was a Roman Catholic survivor whose family was exterminated in the north, Leon Cholgos, as many Filipinos who had a bit of product of Spanish colonialism. He had a Spanish surname. Leon Cholgos came to the United States and he killed the American president on September 11th. 1901, 100 years to the day before September 11th, 2001. When he killed the American president, the American successor to William McKinley, who was the president he killed, the man who took over was Teddy Roosevelt. And the first thing Teddy Roosevelt said was, we've got to hide this. Hide the fact that a yellow, Asian, brown, little coconut nigger killed our president. He said, take that body and you dissolve it in acid so there's not any evidence left. And they took the body and they dissolved it in acid and they created this cover story by approaching this Polish family and they told them, we'll give you 
all kinds of money. You'll be set the rest of your lives. But you tell people your crazy Polish son killed the president. That way, everyone will think a white man killed the president. Now, Leon Cholgaz isn't even a Polish name. But they took the money and they said, yeah, our crazy son killed the president. By the way, they were able to say this because their son had already killed himself. And so this is how they covered that up. I know I destroyed the documents. For those of you who find this hard to believe, think about this. The Americans had established a dictator, a white man named Durham White Stevens in Korea as the dictator of Korea. Now, Korea borders Japan. They're separated by a channel that's so small that you could build a bridge of, uh, through that channel easier than, how would I say it? You couldn't build a bridge between, Jer between continental Europe and Britain, but you could build a bridge between the Korean Peninsula and Japan because if they're so close that if you drank a beer and threw a can inside of the Straits of Tsushima between Korea and Japan, it would float up on the beach on the other side. That's how close they are. A healthy man could swim the distance. So the Americans setting up an American dictator in Korea, Durham White Stevens, is the equivalent as, is, as if the Japanese invaded Mexico and set up a Japanese dictator in Mexico. The Americans wouldn't like that one bit. So obviously the Japanese had every right to be incensed. And beyond that, the Koreans themselves killed that man. They followed him to San Francisco where they assassinated him in front of the ferry building in San Francisco. That made the headlines, the New York Times itself read on its headlines, the American dictator of Korea has been shot. Their method of killing him was based on the same method Leon Cholgas, the Filipino assassin, had used to kill William McKinley. They hid a gun in an arm cast. These are the kinds of struggles that were going on against the American empire, which was out to conquer the world. And so, whereas the British had bribed the Americans off and Hitler was being influenced by certain occult influences going back to the church, the Bavarian Illuminati. He also made certain that aside from the influence of the Germanic Teutonic Knights being a dominant factor in the SS, that they were also Hitler's samurai, that they followed the code of Bushido. This was a kind of Japanized force. And because they were fighting war the American way, all the rest of the German military, the Luftwaffe, their Air Force, their Kriegsmarine, their Navy, their Wehrmacht, their, their army, all of their armed forces were fighting for the nation state of Germany in a conventional war setting. The SS didn't fight for the nation state. The SS fought for the race. The SS fought for the Aryan race and they fought a racial war. This was the kind of war Americans fought. This is why the SS was so feared by the Americans, because well, they fought because, war. Sorry, the, the Americans are white, though, aren't they? The Americans are a pastiche of European races that are dominated until fairly recently by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, what they call WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. This was why during the uh, American Civil War between the states, this is what the difference became. For those who uh, try to understand the American Civil War between the states as some war about slavery, they're completely ignorant. This is the kind of propaganda uh, that has been projected onto that conflict, just like the Americans have misguided every other conflict in terms of revising it. This is called revisionism, when they say that Vietnam was about communism. And when they say that uh, uh, the Civil War in America was about slavery, uh, the reality was that the uh, two areas of American population, the heaviest demographic concentration was obviously on the Eastern seaboard. But the difference between the North and the South 
was that the whites in the north were overwhelmingly descended from an Anglo-Dutch genetic background with an Anglo-Dutch Protestant work ethic, very puritanical. The South was overwhelmingly Gallo-Celtic in their ethnic composition. So they're both whites, but they're completely different whites. The Gallo are French and Scots, Irish, Welsh composition of the South is why the North hated them so much. The British, of course, had been at war with the French for hundreds of years, hundreds. And they had been at war with the Celtic fringe, the Scots, the Irish and the Welsh for hundreds of years more. So the North facing a South that was comprised of what the British would consider a Gallo-Celtic insurgency, decided they were going to exterminate that ethnic enclave. So the American Civil War between the states was simply a continuation of the greater British Anglo-Saxon war against the Celtic fringe. Just as the, as the British had intended to exterminate the Scots and the Irish and the Welsh for centuries, the American Civil War was attempting to do that to their own enclave of such peoples. That is what the American Civil War was about. When Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, that was only in the Confederate States. Slavery was still legal in the United States, and it was also legal wherever the U.S. Army needed labor. Then oh. slavery was reinstitutionalized so that the U.S. Army could get free labor. I, I didn't so they, know that. So why did the why do the English not like the um, the Celts? Well, that um, is a based on the extreme Romanization of the English peoples. The English people were heavily Romanized by Roman occupation um, when they inherited the uh, culture of Rome. Um, they, in many ways, considered themselves the last vestige of the Roman Empire. And they considered the Celts to be the barbarians at the gates. So the North in America considered the South to be the same. So this is the, uh, the truth of these wars. So the American Civil War was a race war. And it was a race war between two different white races. The slaves were simply caught in the middle. Uh, Abraham Lincoln wanted them, the blacks that were freed, deport it to Africa, all of them. As a matter of fact, just as the British, when they declared an end to slavery, dumped all of their black slaves in a nation now called Sierra Leone, which speaks the king's English, the Americans dumped all of their slaves into a nation now known as Liberia, which speaks the president's English, or American English as opposed to British English. These two English-speaking African nation states are biological dump sites, a landfills for slaves that were not wanted in Great Britain or America. Now, Liberia would have expanded exponentially because Lincoln was going to ship all of the freed blacks there. The only thing that stopped it was a Confederate state soldier shot Abraham Lincoln in the head. If it weren't for that, there wouldn't be a black left in the United States today. Other than those in slavery. So the, Under, the, 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 the Protestant people, the wasps, were they part of the Roman Empire as well? Part of what, honey? Oh, the, 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 the Protestants that went to America, were they part of the Roman Empire, the, the Anglo-Saxons? They certainly considered themselves the heirs to that legacy. Uh, certainly the Roman fasces or the bundled rods is in uh, the various uh, government buildings of the capital of the United States. And they bear the symbol of the Roman eagle, the Aquila, uh, became the symbol of the United States itself. So the Americans consider themselves the ultimate heir to the Roman Empire, uh, the successor state after Britain. And um, so this is a continuity of uh, different traditions 
in terms of the convergence with the uh, um, what we were speaking about with Adolf Hitler and his knowledge of Asia and how he became aware, uh, sensitive to the different Asian cultures and respectful of them. And he was quite open about this. Um, he was certainly aware of America's race wars and the way Americans fought uh, war, which was always uh, racial by nature and exterminatory in, uh, in operation. Uh, Adolf Hitler learned that he had to fight the way the enemy fought or he wouldn't be able to win. Uh, so when it came to the uh, kind of conflict that the SS was made to fight, their religion was also that of the pagan Norse gods, the original Germanic gods. Now understand, before there were the Norse gods of Scandinavia, there were Germanic gods. And the Germanic gods were of the Black Forest. They were arboreal or the aurochs of the, of the woods. This meant that they were very similar to the fertility gods of ancient Europe very much like uh, the satyr, uh, Pan, the great god Pan with cloven hooves and uh, heavily endowed penises, uh, fertility gods that were that had the horns of stags. Uh, these uh, extremely blessed or well-endowed, uh, stag-horned, uh, cloven-hooved fertility gods of the Black Forest were what the church declared to be the image of Satan himself when they conquered Gaul or the uh, Germania. So when the Charlemagne, as the great crusader of the First Reich, the Holy Roman Empire, uh, whose capital was in Aachen, um, a city in Germany, uh, when Charlemagne began to rule uh, deep into continental Europe, where his reign ended at what later became the Iron Curtain or the division line between Eastern and Western Germany, Charlemagne's rule stopped at that point on the Elba and the various other dividing lines that the Allies used to divide Germany between East and West later in World War II. The Charlemagne's church or the church using Charlemagne as their battering ram declared the ancient Germanic fertility gods, uh, the aurochs of the Black Forest uh, to be the very image of Satan himself, which has no literal description in the Bible, no physical description. So they made that the physical description, and that way they were trying to convert the uh, native peoples of Europe uh, from paganism towards Christianity. Uh, the SS fought for a return to the ancient pagan gods and the Norse gods. So this was their religious war. And they fought That's for how this. Does, sorry, how does that link with the Japanese? Are the Japanese into paganism and the elementals? Uh, the Japanese follow Shinto and Ryobyo Shinto or the Imperial Shinto is based on the Kami way. The Kami are, of course, the spirits of the elements. These is based on the understanding, the knowledge that uh, all stones uh, plants, rivers, mountains, trees have their own kami or spirit. And uh, the very term kamikaze means the spirit storm, the storm of the spirits. So this is what saved Japan from the Mongol invasion. So when you see what uh, the Japanese worshipped, very similar to the German sense of paganism, this was a kind of a uh, heathen crusade, a pagan campaign uh, that the Americans claimed was diabolic, but it was what understood was natural. In other words, uh, the Germans and the Japanese were trying to preempt the ecological catastrophe that the Americans and Russians under their perverted Christianity have brought the earth to. Earth is on the verge of its, well, we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction due to this idea that Christianity has been perverted into. The idea that uh, you can destroy it all because God will create a new heaven and a new earth. 
therefore this earth is dispensable. This earth is disposable. This is exactly what Adolf Hitler, the man who instituted the world's first environmental laws, and people can look this up themselves, it's a historical fact, the first environmental laws in the world were established by Adolf Hitler. This is what he was trying to preempt. This is what the Japanese were trying to preempt. One of the many reasons the Americans wanted to destroy them both. So, so, so what's happening now um, with, with Russia? Um, with Russia versus America, is that the same heathen versus the anti-gods? No. It's all part of that same struggle and how it's devolved in its late stages to the allies now turning against each other. Understand that um, one of the first uh, nations to declare war against the Axis, in fact, the first nation to fight the Axis was China. Not communist China, but nationalist China. And when it came to nationalist China, it was fighting the Japanese from 1931. They were fighting the Japanese. This was well before the Polish people were fighting against the Germans and the Soviets in 1939. So the nationalist Chinese became the first signatory to the establishment of the United Nations when it was formed as an organization of war against the Axis. And yet, later on, the Americans betrayed them to put the communist Chinese on the Security Council of the United Nations on behalf of their Soviet allies. And so now these allies are all turning against each other in their madness because the world's been taken to the brink and there's not enough resources for them anymore. They're fighting over what's left. 90% of the world's high-end superconductors or semiconductors, the uh, chips, the microchips, these are produced in Taiwan, the island on which I was born, where the nationalist Chinese retreated to to reestablish themselves. They require neon gas. That neon gas is produced or sources from the Ukraine. The Ukraine also has 25% a full quarter of the world's black soil, which is the most fertile soil in the world, which enables them to produce far more food than they need to eat and have enough surplus to feed the rest of the world. If the Russians capture the Ukraine, they have effectively half the world's food supply when they combine that with their own productivity levels and the neon gas by which the Chinese in Taiwan build the semiconductors that run our world, our cell phones, our computers, our jet planes, our missile brains. These are all microchips produced in Taiwan. Without the neon gas from Ukraine, the Sino-Slavic Synaxis, the revanchist revisionist Russian empire and the communist Chinese run the world. Beyond that, they say, the Ukrainians are Nazi, even though they have a Jewish president. This comes from the fact that the Ukrainian people overthrew what they considered to be a Jewish tyranny. All of Eastern Europe was under the Jewish pale of settlement. This was these Jewish emigres from originally displaced from the fallen Hazar Empire. The Hazar Empire were those Jews in the Tartarian Peninsula, where today we find the nation states like Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. These are the Caucasus Mountains from where the very word Caucasian comes from. And there, the Turkish Empire that had conquered this area was converted to Judaism. Now, the Christians had the religious war that they called a crusade. The Muslims have a religious war that they call a jihad. The Jewish Mohammedans 
or shall I say Abrahamites, really. But just to clarify that statement, the term Judeo-Islamic would make far more sense than the absurd term Judeo-Christian, because those are both Semitic cultures that have far more involved and connected roots than Christians and Jewish people do. But the Jewish method of religious warfare is called Holocaust. This is based on the old orders from the Abrahamic God himself, the monotheistic God who gave the order to burn Canaan to the root, enslave the woman and children, uh, kill every animal, every man who's capable of welding a weapon. That means every man who wasn't a child, the rest would be enslaved. In fact, there were times when God ordered the entire genocide of a people, the Abrahamic God of the original Israelites of the Old Testament. This murderous war god, Yahweh, ordered the total annihilation, the burning to the ground, the burning alive of the entire population of Canaan. The reference for this is Holocaust. The Jews perpetrated the first Holocaust, and in the midst of some of their militant holocaust, they converted people forcibly to Judaism. One of them was the Turkish tribe of the Hazars. These were the people who later migrated with the collapse of their empire throughout Eastern Europe. They became the people of the book, as the Jewish people were always acculturated uh, to be proud of, uh, the keepers of accounts. Because Christians and Muslims both considered it a sin uh, to love money, the love of money being the root of all evil in both religions, the Jewish people were usually allowed to handle the money. And these Jewish people then assimilated to become a middle class. They were the middle class throughout the pale of settlement in Eastern Europe. They had an empire spanning from sea to sea, from the Baltic to the Black Sea, in which they were the doctors, the lawyers, the uh, accountants, the specialists, dentists and the like. People envied them who were peasants. They were working the land and had no way to send their children to any higher education. They rebelled before the Nazis even rolled in. By the time the Nazis rolled in, these people were the people who were bringing the Jews to the Nazis to kill. The greatest outdoors extermination campaign took place in Ukraine at Babi Yar. Thousands of Jews were killed over many days. People just kept firing rounds until their guns were empty, until their shoulders were dislocated by recoil. Then they would pick up their handgun with their left hand and order other people to do the shooting for them. And all of this is real, all of this happened. And the Ukrainians had to do this because of what they had suffered. Under the Jewish commissars, who had brought Bolshevik communism into the Ukraine, which the Ukrainians had resisted, they suffered the Holodomor. The Holodomor was when all their food was taken to feed the Russians, and the Russians starved the Ukrainians en masse. 15 million Ukrainians died under communist Bolshevik hands, coordinated by Jewish commissars. So they had every reason to hate the Jews. They had lost half their population to the Jews. Therefore, they struck back and they joined the Third Reich. They fought on the side of the Nazis. Who can blame them? Only an idiot. That's why the Russians say the Ukrainians are Nazis. Nobody in the West understands it because they're completely ignorant of history. They have no idea of the Holodomor. More Ukrainians died in the Holodomor than Jews died in the Holocaust. Over twice as many, as a matter of fact. But it's not in any of your textbooks. This is why the Ukrainians are fighting the Russians and why the Russians are trying to finish the job of exterminating the Ukrainians. 
So this is the reason for that war as well. <laughs> I see. It's interesting. I mean, why do you think that those two, like heathen uh, versus Roman Catholic, has, I mean, where did it really originate from, that seed? Understand this. Now, the other day I had um, someone on my own program that I was interviewing. And this was an American overwhelmed by Russian propaganda. The Russians are very much online and they use the internet to poison men's minds. It's when I did security contracts, one of the things that I saw when, and as a Briton, you've heard the term rave, you know, old rave parties they used to have, block house parties. Yeah. And that meant that these were parties that would take up at least an entire house and often an entire block, hence the name house party or block party. And these raves, when they were held in America, well, the ones in San Francisco that I was doing security at, the things you would see were unbelievable. The police, uh, they couldn't stop it. So they simply would allow the firemen to surround these rave parties with ambulances and fire engines and then try and save as many kids as they could who overdosed. Uh, there would be, you'd go inside the bathroom and there'd be stomach pumps, used stomach pumps all over the floor. Now, one of the things the kids would do is they would take ecstasy and they would use eye drops to put it directly into their eyes because it would go straight through the optic nerve and into their brain in a second. Just like that. That's what the internet is. These men get on the internet, their eyes are open to an eyedropper full of sewage from the Russians that goes straight into their brains. They eat that up, it fills the empty space between their ears. So I had this American on my show, and I like him personally. He's a nice guy, John Miranda, an orphan, adopted into a fairly wealthy family. He went to Scandinavia, met a Georgian refugee. And as I said, this is the nation state of Georgia, the same nation state Stalin was born in. And as I said, uh, where the Caucasus Mountains are, where we get the term Caucasian, as white a girl as you can meet. Her family had been murdered by the Russians. She was a refugee in Scandinavia because they had to take a quota of refugees and she wound up among them. She was hoping by marrying this American, she could move to America and start a new life. By the time she was pregnant with his two children, twin sons, he didn't take her to America. He said, I'm staying here in Scandinavia to prepare Europe for the Russian takeover. Vladimir Putin is the man who will save the world. They're the real Christians. Of course, she left him. She went to Norway. He wasn't allowed to follow her across the border. He wound up arrested in Sweden and living in the woods. The point of this story is when I brought him on my show. Talk to him about Satanism because he said, Russia's fighting Satanism. The Americans and the West are satanic. And I said, let's go with that. I told him about how I worked at the Presidio military base, how I was assigned liaison to the man who wrote the chaplain's handbook for all branches of service. Marines, Navy, Coast Guard, Army. Michael Aquino wrote the chaplain's handbook put chapters in it on Satanism. The orders in the chaplain's handbook imply that every rabbi, every deacon, every priest, step back and stand down whenever a satanic chaplain shows up because Satanism is the unofficial religion of the US military. There's a video you can find on YouTube as respectable as it gets. This isn't conspiracy crap. This is produced by major 
communications networks called the dark side of Al Dura. Al is the Arabic word for the A L. Dura D O U R A. The dark side of the Dura. It opens with. Dick Cheney saying. We must go to the dark side. We must go to the dark side. And they follow this US Army Ranger, one of the elites. US Army Green Berets were supposed to fight behind the lines, behind enemy lines, as an armed version of the Peace Corps. This was their original mission statement. They weren't supposed to get involved in combat. For battlefield assassins, the snipers, sent to kill enemy leaders, they had the Black Berets. Those were the U.S. Army Rangers. U.S. Army Ranger John Needham is whom the documentary, The Dark Side of Aldura, follows. And as a U.S. Army Ranger, he started taking photographs, which they show in that video. You'll see them yourself. Photographs of the satanic chaplains serving his unit, where they crack open the skulls of young boys, never girls. They want the boys because they want the testosterone. The girls, they got estrogen, and that would emasculate the men. So they take the brains of young boys, and they eat them. This is a satanic sacrament. The photos are there. The dark side of Algeria. John Needham took them. He sent so them to... Do, 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 do you think that um, the one side of humanity is on side with the dark Anunnaki and others with the Anunnaki that created us? Let's balance it out more directly. In terms of the Anunnaki... I feel that that is, in a sense, it confuses the issue right now. So the better way to explain it would be to finish the thought thread here. John Needham, of course, because he tried to report and expose these crimes, wound up being tortured to death. They tortured him terribly, sent him home insane. He killed his girlfriend. The judge thought he was so insane, he wasn't even responsible for his actions. Let him go into the care provision of his own father. And then the guy, John Needham, just died walking with his father down a beach just like that, like somebody pushed a button. An occult assault. The whole point of that is that that's the military aspect of this. When it comes to the civilian aspect, Michael Aquino, who set up this chaplaincy of all these satanic chaplains, the satanic sacrament of eating young boys' brains on the battlefield. Michael Aquino, at the Presidio military base, was confronted with the fact that I began to hemorrhage information on him. Now, he didn't know it at the time. One of the women who took action was a San Francisco Police Department inspectoress named Sandy Gallant. Very tall, Germanic, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Nordic Aryan woman who decided she was going to take a stand. She became famous because she, it will, there was a headless body found in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. In the place of a human head was a chicken head. She identified this as voodoo, Santeria, from Latin America, and said, Somebody's going to try and reunite the head with the body to create a zombie. Everybody laughed at her, but they put a guard, not a policeman, but an armed private security guard they hired to guard the body just in case. That man, that man died in the line of duty fighting off a gang of people who came to try and reunite that head with the body. They never got the body. He died making certain they didn't. She became famous. She wrote a policeman's handbook on occult crime. This became, if you've ever seen police ring binders, the ring binders because new laws are put in that they need to enforce. Sometimes these laws are changed and they take those out of the ring binders. So this police handbook on occult crime was put in ring binder style. That's how you identify the real copies and uh, from anything that's forged out there. And uh, this was put into police handbooks all over the United States. She became famous, a consultant on occult crime nationwide. And she was going to take down Michael Aquino. 
who considered her a personal enemy. So he sent his man, Lieutenant Colonel James Channon, at the time, who also retired, a full colonel. He was turned into a sex bomb portrayed in the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats by George Clooney. So George Clooney is sexing up this god-awful subhuman piece of garbage, Colonel James Channon of the 1st Earth Battalion, who in reality had big black bags under his eyes that were the cover of raw liver. And you could smell his own decaying liver on his breath because he drank so much. That's who George Clooney is portraying. He went around the country and he talked to the FBI and local police constabularies and told everybody, hey, if some Roman Catholic robbed a bank and dropped a religious medallion of the Virgin Mary on site the scene of the crime, does that implicate the Catholic Church? And they said, no, of course not. So he said, well, anytime you find a body missing its head that happens to be in the middle of a pentagram drawn in human blood or goat's blood or cat's blood or dog's blood and these kind of pentagrams on the walls and the murder scene, or anything, that doesn't implicate the Church of Satan. That just means it's another lone actor, just like any Roman Catholic who still carries a crucifix or saints medallions, goes around committing crimes, doesn't implicate the Roman Catholic Church. You have to consider the satanic church innocent of these crimes committed by lone actors. And that's when the FBI, uh, all the rest of these uh, national departments, as well as massive departments like Los Angeles Police Department, LAPD, they all said, fine, means less work for us. So they ripped all of the occult crime pages out of their ring binders. And at that point, Satanists in America were given a 007 license to kill. The police will take a fire hose and just hose away the bloody pentagrams and destroy all evidence, thus enabling the Satanists. Thousands of children disappear every year. Thousands of people are murdered, sacrificed, and nothing is done. To top it off, Aquino was finally brought to trial. And they said it's a national security issue. He can't be prosecuted. So he got away scot-free and he made certain that it became the law in the state of California, which is the economic engine of the United States. The state of California alone has an economy larger than that of the greater British Empire. The only economies ahead of California are Germany, Japan, China, and the United States. Great Britain is behind my golden state. And here in California, one of with a population larger than most nations, they made it a law that children's testimony cannot be accepted in a court of law. That means you can rape a child, torture a child, film them in a pornographic film, and their testimony will never be accepted in a court of law. You can do anything you want to a child in America. You have free license. This is a satanic empire. This is the nation state of Satan himself. So when I told this to John Miranda, he says, that's why I'm on the side of the Russians. So then I told him, well, you know, I speak Russian. You know that I was dispatched to Russia for a period of time. For years, I was advised never to tell anybody because they'd hold it against me like they did against, you know, that great patsy, Lee Harvey Oswald. But I'm beyond all that now. I've been a public informant for so long, they can't pull that off against me. And I explained to him, I said, when Michael Aquino as a, Defense Intelligence Agency officer for the DIA was given the orders to make contact with some form of resistance behind the Iron Curtain in the Soviet Union itself, the belly of the beast. He understood that this was going to be difficult for a normal person thinking inside the box. Now, the Soviet Union is an atheist state, was 
they had outlawed the church. Because they had outlawed the church, the Soviet Union could never admit the existence of Satanists. If they admitted the existence of Satanists, that meant, well, there had to be a God. Therefore, the Soviet Union denied that Satanists could even exist because there was no God. The end result was that the only resistance in the Soviet Union, the one the KGB could never interfere with because that would admit the existence of a God, was the Satanic Underground. The man that Aquino sent me to talk to behind the Iron Curtain was Alexander Dugan. Alexander Dugan was proudly introduced by Alex Jones multiple times as Putin's brain. Like the historical Rasputin, he's Putin's Rasputin. For those who try to buy into the bullshit that this man doesn't have any real influence, his book on geopolitics, the foundations of geopolitics, which has the occult symbol of chaos on its cover, the compass with the cardinal points shorter than the other four points, symbolizing chaos as opposed to a corrected compass pattern. His book was taken on as the textbook for the Russian military. To say that this man doesn't have influence is ludicrous, laughably ridiculous, absurd. This man had influence on Putin invading Ukraine based on the geopolitics outlined in his books, which the Russian military is using as a textbook. He killed his own daughter. His daughter had become estranged, was threatening to go Christian. She blew up in a car bomb right in front of his face so he could stand there with this position of cinematic outrage, this, this stance, this pose, while she burned alive in front of him, making no moves to retrieve her from the burning vehicle. That's the man who I had to talk to. That's the man who helped to put Putin in power. Russia is just as satanic as America. America and Russia are the satanic allies the Axis was fighting against. The Germans and the Japanese were the good guys. For those of you who don't understand this, think about Julius Stryker, an infamous Jew baiter. Julius Stryker was a World War I veteran who had killed in the line of duty in World War I on the front lines. He was a sadist and a pornographer. But he had never killed anyone during the time of the Third Reich. Never gave any orders to dispatch anyone to a Konstanzlagen, a concentration camp, or a Totenslagen, a death camp. Never had anyone murdered by a firing squad. The only thing he did was run a Judeophobic rag and a media machine that basically said the Jews were responsible for Germany's problems. They hanged him at Nuremberg for what he said. And they said, words count. Words cast spells. That's why it's called spelling. That's why spell books are called grimoires, which is simply a word for grammars. This is, of course, all real. The man's words killed people. But if he were in America, they'd say, oh, that's freedom of speech. But they said, oh, but because this is international, there's no American laws at work here. We can kill him because there's no freedom of speech. So either the United Nations apologizes for executing Julia Stryker, or they execute Paul Ehrlich, who lives right here in San Francisco, certainly has property here. Paul Ehrlich is Jewish. Paul Ehrlich for years, decades, generations by now, has said, there's too many people. You've got to start killing them. You've got to start killing people. 
arrest people who have more than one child. His science, all quackery, was taken by Henry Kissinger, who along with Richard Nixon went to China in the 1970s. When Richard Nixon was visiting Mao Zedong, to try and play the China card and get the Chinese on America's side against the Soviet Union. Henry Kissinger visited Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping became the next leader of communist China, the man who said to get rich is glorious, the man who led the big industrial revolution of China in the modern sense. Deng Xiaoping's own son had been thrown out of a window because Deng Xiaoping was known to be a capitalist roader, very dangerous in a communist country. Deng Xiaoping was told by Henry Kissinger, you'll get the biggest World Bank loan, the biggest international monetary fund support if you institute a one-child policy based on the science of Paul Ehrlich. There's too many people, and therefore, if you have one child, this will help your nation progress, modernize. So based on Paul Ehrlich's science, Deng Xiaoping instituted a draconian one-child policy in communist China. Hundreds of millions of Chinese babies were murdered. Because every Chinese person wants a son to carry on the family name, they aborted all the girls. Those girls that were born they sold on the human trafficking meat market. Don't take my word for this. Look it up yourself. Chinese baby girls adopted out of China by the millions. People could order a Chinese baby girl. Where'd they all go? How many people do you see raising a Chinese baby girl? A lot of them were literally eaten. That's no joke. That's no rumor. A lot of them were sacrificed. Most of them became sex slaves. All because a Jewish man named Paul Ehrlich in the greater San Francisco Bay Area Metroplex region says it's cool. But because he's Jewish, it's all right. And because it's only Chinese girls being sold, eaten and enslaved, and millions of Chinese babies being murdered. It's all cool. It's all right. They aren't even human. This is what the Nazis and the Japanese were fighting against. This That's is really the word. So if you were called as a witness to the trial, you would be on the side of your father. Yes, very much so. For people who don't understand what's going on here, Adolf Hitler himself would revel if he were captured. He would revel in his opportunity to tell his side of the story. He would articulate as much as he could what I articulate today. In terms of my mother, when she was very young, proving herself adept at languages, she was used in the international scene as a translator. She was originally used in Asia. She spoke Manchurian, now practically a dead language. The Manchurians were practically exterminated by the communists. There's only maybe a few people on earth who speak the Manchurian language today. But whenever you see that movie, The Last Emperor of China, about Henry Puyi, Henry Puyi was Manchurian, not Chinese. Uh, the Chinese were under a Manchu dynasty for years. And uh, what happened was Henry Puyi was the last of that line at the time. So my mother, when she demonstrated her adeptness, she was also recognized because of her nobility. Now, Japan had a situation similar to that of England. England had the Great War of the Roses, in which they fought to decide which dynasty would inherit the kingdom of England. And the Japanese had a similar situation. In the ancient days, the first emperor of China, Emperor Qin, 
from whence the very name China comes from. It's named after him, the first yellow emperor. Emperor Qin ordered his alchemist, Fu Zhu, to take 3,000 children. There were 1,500 girls, 1,500 boys. He said, you take these children, you tear them apart, you bleed them dry, you skin them alive, whatever it takes to find the secret of youth so you can make me young again. And the alchemist Fu Zhu said, well, your highness, um, I must use herbs in combination with this formulary, and these herbs are only to be found in the land of Wa, which at that time meant Japan. Wa meaning the center of equilibrium, the land of balance. And so the emperor gave him permission to take the children with him to Japan. He never returned. He took the children with him and he established a new dynasty in Japan, ethnically Chinese, the Kyushu dynasty. The Kyushu dynasty was never spoken of in Japanese history books until fairly recently when scholars even began to dare to write about it. Because eventually, through various wars, the Yamato dynasty from the north overtook Japan. That's the imperial dynasty that ruled Japan for the next 3000 years. The longest ruling dynasty, the longest living lineage in all of humanity. Still the emperors of today. The Yamato dynasty at the time that my mother was born. Her father was Chinese. Her mother was Japanese. She was born in Tokyo. This marriage was allowed. Whenever I speak to Chinese about this, they are in awe. They're just incredulous because they said your father, your mother's father must have been an extraordinarily important man. Of course he was. He was of the Kyushu dynasty lineage. This is why the Japanese allowed him to marry a Japanese woman. It was one of the reasons that China and Japan were able to reunite in a sense, in the sense of noble families reuniting. This was important because they were trying to establish peace during the Sino-Japanese War. They felt that a reunification of the noble lines would help in this regard. So that's how my mother was born, delivered from her mother's womb in the midst of the great Tokyo earthquake and fire. Tokyo collapsed and burned around her while she was brought into this world. When she emerged, um, she was very precocious, learned very quickly. And because of her noble bloodline, this was noted. And she became an interpreter. She was never officially something that the West even knew about, but she was brought to Berlin speaking German. She was introduced to Adolf Hitler by Otto Dietrich. Now, Otto Dietrich was Hitler's press chief. He was a general in the SS. And Otto Dietrich brought uh, my mother to Hitler's attention. She ultimately had been given orders by Emperor Hirohito, who was a marine biologist and very heavily involved with funding research into biological warfare. Again, all of the details behind this are in the Roswell Deception, subtitled The Demystification of World War II by Douglas Dietrich and Peter Moon. So when she was brought to the attention of Adolf Hitler, she even at one point convinced him to dress up in a kimono. And this photograph was taken. And of course, ultimately unleashed on the internet, where you have every attempt to try and cover it, revise it, scrub it as something else. People claim, oh, it's some man in cosplay. Uh, all of this is crap, of course. It's Adolf Hitler in a kimono. My mother talked him into wearing that while she gave him a blowjob, basically collected his sperm. The reason Hirohito as a marine biologist. Oh, what, did she, what did she do uh, with the sperm? Um, understand that um, 
there are ginseng solutions, first off, in which to put it into when she collected it in a test tube while giving him a blowjob. She said Hitler didn't seem to mind. He didn't really care at that point. I guess he was just getting off. <laughs> so she uh, she was able to put it in a test tube that contained a ginseng solution. Understand that the ginseng solution is used to preserve sperm until you can get it into refrigeration. It uh, keeps the sperm alive for days if necessary. But she got it into refrigeration quicker than that, and it was shipped back to Tokyo. Now, since she wound up um, basically servicing Hitler more than once, she collected a test tube for herself, which she kept in private refrigeration. The reason Hirohito and the Japanese biologists wanted a collection of Hitler's sperm was they were ultimately hoping to clone him and perhaps even create a double of him that they could present to the world in case something happened to him. So Hirohito was definitely thinking ahead. Hirohito was responsible for many uh, genetic experiments uh, before Americans were even aware of genetics. Until the axis, the term genes simply meant mathematical units of inheritance. Until a Jewish woman, uh, Rosalind Franklin, isolated the helical structure of the DNA in the 1950s, dioxyribonucleic acid, that's when our concept of genetics changed completely, and we began to think of it as something that could be engineered instead of simply genealogically manipulated. It is marrying people of certain height or certain IQ to try and uh, provide better genes. That's called eugenics. U E U means good in the Greek language. Eugenics means good genes. Dysgenics, D Y S, means bad in the Greek language. Dysgenics means bad genes. Um, I met a Russian doctor once, a female. Her name was Eugenia. And I was so excited. I said, Oh, wow, your name means of good genes, of good race. And she said, yes. I said, God, you never had meet anyone with a name like that in the West. Um, but at any rate, when it comes to the, um, uh, the case of my mother, uh, the sperm sample that she kept in refrigeration ultimately was used uh, because when she married my father, George Dietrich, he had been a sailor who had been exposed to a lot of radiation from tests everywhere across the Pacific, from Enuitoc to Bikini Atoll. He used to make the joke that he could probably signal planes to land by using his zipper to do an SOS or something, uh, because his balls probably glowed in the dark. He was effectively sterilized. Um, he had been married five times, maybe six. So many times he was considered a scandal to the US Navy, who stripped him down by a rank from chief petty officer. And so George Joseph Dietrich probably, almost certainly, he was incapable of being my father or my sisters. Instead, we were produced, as my mother told me, by the sperm that she had taken out of the refrigerator. And by the way, when you refrigerate sperm, it can last for half a century and still be viable. This is a fact that anybody can verify for themselves. And uh, so, as she said, she had it originally in the ginseng solution, got it to refrigeration, and then um, the one vial or test tube was sent to Tokyo. The next she kept for herself. She ultimately used that to impregnate herself twice, first with my sister, who was born in 1963, and then I was delivered in 1966. Matter of fact, when my sister was born, my legal father, the man who raised and guided me, the chief petty officer of the United States Navy, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, thought my mother had played around on him. He said the baby was so dark and hairy, she looked like a little Filipino, my sister. When I was born, I was blondish and looked exactly like my father. So he said, yeah, then he uh, basically accepted that, that we both must be his children, or at least he stopped complaining. <laughs> and so he, uh, he, uh, well, I was raised by him, but uh, the biological father was almost certainly Adolf Hitler. Let it be known, of course, if George Joseph Henry Dietrich were my biological father, I would be proud of that and uh, certainly honor that as I honor and respect him anyway as the man who raised and guided me. 
but the chances for that are simply medically just not really possible considering the fact that he had five other marriages now my father was in his own way in a positive sense by the way just so people understand this racism in and of itself at baseline is not negative it is a redundant survival mechanism we are all racist no matter what ethnicity we are i try to confront my racism and contend with it but we have to be honest about it in terms of racism where it gets pathological is where it becomes all consuming or uh, someone's soul identity this is not something that uh, however in and of itself is bad if people want to live among their own kind why is that a negative i of course i'm of mixed race heritage certainly i'm not racist in any sense like that but i am of course aware that we are all subject to visceral reactions so when it comes to something like my dad he had in a sense this quaint form of positive racism in that because all of his previous wives had been white it is european american or rather americans of european descent genetically he thought marrying an asian woman would give him a better chance at having children because he thought asian women would be more fertile so when my mother delivered him two children he simply attributed it to that that asian women are models of fecundity and uh, therefore was more open to this being all real that we were his children which we never disabused him of that notion till the day he died so that's the situation in general at its most basic behind uh my uh lineage but do bear in mind adolf hitler is known to have had many children in his lifetime there are all kinds of incidents that i have covered in the past uh there was a french man named lobjoy who uh was a child of hitler who hitler personally promoted to be the chief of police of vichy france and then after the war sued the french government for some benefits because he had served the vichy french government during world war 2 as basically their chief of police and uh lobjoy was uh never one who won his case i believe but the fact that he launched his case and that it was considered nobody argued with him nobody said uh you're a liar he may have lost the case in terms of getting benefits but it's not like anybody really uh said that what you say can't be true but they pretty much all knew that in the town where he was born uh or rather the mother who had given birth to him was in a town where Adolf Hitler had been stationed during the war for a period of time and the people in the, the town remembered Adolf Hitler drawing pictures so it's not like and when Adolf Hitler came in World War 2 and promote had him promote it and as a matter of fact that piece of paper in which he signed for his son's promotion is the only document in existence which has his middle name Adolphus Jacob Hitler there is no other document in history that has Hitler's middle name on it most historians don't even know he had one this is how ignorant if your average historian is ignorant of this what's the point of you accepting anything they say there's nothing they're telling you that's worth a damn and these people are telling you about hitler the most talked about man on earth it's a joke all of allied history is a lie revisionism you, you can tell i've just heard that the bbc there's uh, the people are, are protesting outside the bbc today about being told lies about the about the you know what the you know Oh, whatever it is that's the latest i'm sure that there's so many lies at this point it's impossible <laughs> to keep score i mean why even bother it's just all a lie yeah <laughs> it's effectively uh it, it's this is like uh, uh honestly the um uh the british people need to come to terms with the fact that the british empire may have been great but it was also evil 
And oh. they have to understand that one doesn't accomplish that level of power without ruthlessness. And their empire was run by the majority of the elite who belong to the Hellfire Club. So when you take a look at that level of Satanism, for those of you who don't know anything about the Hellfire Club, look it up. I can't do justice to it any more than what you're going to read. The majority of the British elite were part of what was called the Hellfire Club, which was satanic, and they performed orgies and rituals, and they were responsible for the decision to crucify the subcontinent of Asian India. Now, the British are remarkable for growing hedges. These English hedgerows are remarkable in the sense that Britain is one of the most inhospitable climates in the world. There were 14 attempts by Homo sapiens, the species of humanity, to conquer the British Isles before the 14th attempt finally succeeded, only because the ice had withdrawn far enough and the Atlantic current had grown warm enough where they could stay. When they did stay on the islands of Albion, they're left with a miserable gray climate, and yet they managed to develop this system of gardening where they could coax from the ground things of beauty. And then they took this talent and they took it down to Asian India where the temperature is tropical and the climates are fecund and fertile. And they grew super massive hedgerows of mutated thorn brush that divided people from each other. This mm -hmm. was the Berlin Wall of its day. They grew one north to south, one east to west, and they divided India into four quarters so they could isolate one part from the other whenever they needed to starve an area out in rebellion. Hundreds of millions of people died as a result of Britain's ability to isolate which area of India got the food, got the medical supplies, got anything at all. Oh. This was the legacy of the Hellfire Club. Naturally, when the Asian... <laughs> Who did they... You're saying they supported uh, uh, Satan. So who... Who was Satan when it comes to, was it one of the Anunnaki? So when it comes to, this gets very confusing because the Anunnaki is a term that is thrown about by the Herodians, the Edomites, the anti-God cultists. So to try and explain to people the what Peter Moon and I are trying to explain in our new book we are writing, we are trying to outline this situation so that people understand it. Now, so far, I've been very hard on uh, many people uh, that were, well, much of the Jewish culture and what has resulted from uh, uh, a lot of um, Jewish hostility and interaction with the world around it. Now, I'm going to try and balance that out. And it's going to probably sound insincere and maybe not even enough. But it is sincere and it is something that I say earnestly. Uh, and it's a, it's it's difficult. It's difficult because we don't want anyone to degenerate this into there are good Jews and there are bad Jews. That's just awful. Uh, there is, however, uh, a Jewish tradition which is far more true to its heritage. And then there is the Orodian anti-tradition, the counter-tradition or contra-Judaism. All of this emerged most forcefully around the time of the Roman Empire, the time of the birth of Christ, the time that Erod, an Edomite, the blood enemy of the Jewish people, was installed as essentially the judge, Shofet, or king of Israel. Palestine, Jewish 
the Jewish kingdom under the Roman Empire. When Arad was established at that time, of course, if you're a Christian, you know him as the man who tried to kill your God. This was a man who ordered every firstborn son annihilated in his attempt to seek out and kill the Christ child. Now, one of the things that he did was he, for one thing, if it weren't for him, there wouldn't be any Jewish archaeological architecture of note in Israel for tourists to look at today. Basically, this man was almost single-handedly responsible for building fortresses, castles all over what today is Israel because he wanted a place to escape to every step he took because he knew every honest Jew wanted to kill him. The Romans had put him in power because he was an enemy of the Jewish people. He had taken one of their great secrets and he sold it to the world, what he could of it. Now, in terms of this great secret, uh, understand that when it comes to the great color of the sky, the sea, the blue, this is the blue you see on the Israeli flag today. Now people say that's the flag of the two rivers between which a greater Israel will expand into. I'm not going to argue with that. But the fact remains that the uh, blue represents the sky and the sea, the color thereof. Now, you can only see this blue when you look at the sky as a whole or the sea as a whole. You don't see it when you try to contain it in a glass. You can take the ocean into a cup and all you see is water. It's transparent. You don't see it as blue. You can take the sky and hermetically seal it into a jar and all you see is emptiness. You don't see the blue. This is what the blue represents is you have to look into the face of God himself to see that sacred blue. This is a dye that was produced by the Jewish people for thousands of years. It's called Tekelet Blue. It came from a mollusk, the uh, trunculus snail, Murex trunculus, the mollusk of the millennium. And it took enormous work. You got a single drop out of each snail shell and it produced an odor so horrific that it would sink into your very skin and you would stink for the rest of your life if you worked with this as a career. So much so that any woman who married you was allowed to divorce you. No one could live with you. The uh, dye had to be taken from the original purple color, which is what it produced, and held to the sunlight, which chemically altered it alchemically transmuted it into the blue. The Romans weren't interested in going all the way with this. They just took the purple. That became the color of Rome, and that became the color of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, there was a radical Zionist faction which led Judaism into anti-godliness. The fact remains that Zionism is not any Jewish tradition. It's a militant movement that started in the 1920s, the decade that my mother was born. Zionism was this idea that we've got to take the diaspora, which is the Jews spread all over the world, and bring them into Palestine again, re-establish Israel on earth. Now, the overwhelming majority of modern Jewish people in the diaspora were successful, educated people, accountants, doctors, attorneys. None of them wanted to go back to a strip of desert along the Levantine beach, which as far as they were concerned, uh, not even the lizards found fit. They thought that was insane. These were a bunch of militant terrorists these Zionists, 
They're very identical to today's American incels or involuntary celibates who are online all day in their misogyny, talking about women and coloreds and getting revenge. That's what these Zionists were, the equivalent thereof. So maniacal in their in their thirst for vengeance that they made statements like Jabotinsky. Ze'ev Jabotinsky said, you must destroy the diaspora or the diaspora will destroy you. Meaning that they'll all breed out. They'll interbreed with the Gentiles and the Jewish race will die off, breed out. Madness. It's proven to be completely untrue. He and Theodor Herzl, who said, Anti-Semitism is our greatest ally. We must make the lives of Jews as painful as possible. We must have as many of them die as possible, be killed as possible, so they'll be forced to go back to Palestine. That no place will welcome them, and they'll have no place else to go. Now, Mossad simply means the Institute, just like Al-Qaeda simply means the base. Al-Qaeda was based on a computer base, which the CIA used to keep track of Arabic terrorists that it recruited to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan. That was the origins of Al-Qaeda. One of the men they recruited was Osama bin Laden. Mossad is similar to that kind of concept. It meant the Institute, and it was around long before there was an Israel. Just as if you take a look at the foundation of the U.S. Army or Navy or even the Marine Corps, they were established in 1775 before there was even a United States. So when it comes to Mossad, they were a terrorist network like we would consider ISIS today. They were the people Adolf Hitler found himself dealing with. Benito Mussolini found himself dealing with because the fascists and the Nazis wanted what they wanted. Get the Jews out of Europe. So they cooperated with these maniacal lunatic terrorists who were unpredictably violent, erratic in their behavior. Many of these people who became the leaders, the founding fathers of Israel were designated terrorists by the greater British empire. As a matter of fact, the British Empire considered them a Nazi insurgency because it was the SS that trained them. You think these Jews who are normally doctors, lawyers, and attorneys, uh, or accountants, I mean to say, barristers, accountants, and uh, physicians, you think they know how to farm oranges, irrigate the desert, organize Panzer battalions to fight off Arab mechanized units. They didn't know any of that. Adolf Hitler taught them through the SS and the Nazis. Without Adolf Hitler, there would be no Israel. Without Nazi training in weapons, tactics, even agriculture, there would be no Israel. So Adolf Hitler used one of his Hebrew-speaking henchmen, Adolf Eichmann, to help organize the transfer of Jews to Palestine. It was called Ha'avara, literally in the Hebrew moving house, the transfer agreement. Hitler was able to maintain a scientific edge because he wouldn't allow a brain drain. He told all Germans, if you leave Germany, your money stays here. If you leave Germany, you leave without a penny. But he allowed the Jews to leave and take their money with them. This is how many of them relocated to Palestine. The British considered this a Nazi insurgency. This is why the British sank every ship full of Jewish emigres that they could. Don't take my word for it. Look this up. There was a ship called the Exodus. The Exodus was sank by the British using machine gun fire. There was a ship with 60,000 Jewish emigres on board that a British plane sank, torpedoed in 1945. 
And the British said, oh, hey, you know, an accident in wartime. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's it's all a lie. Every ship full of Jewish emigres the British could locate, they sank to prevent them from reaching Israel. The greatest e enemies of the Jewish attempt to establish Palestine as an occupied Israeli state was the British Empire because they considered this a Nazi objective, which it was. But you know what? Just like the Nazis succeeded in Spain, where Francisco Franco stayed in power throughout the 1970s till the day he died, so too Israel got established, regardless. Now, all of this is not true to the original Judaism, which was expecting such a reestablishment if ever under a king of the Davidian line. This was an apartheid state established by a bunch of atheistic socialists. And all of this traces back to Iran and his selling of the secret of the, the snail, if you will. Now that secret was lost. Everyone forgot how the dye was produced. That meant that the Jewish culture lost its key to its priesthood. Uh, Jesus Christ was walking down a street when a woman touched his tassels on his robe, the blue tassels of the city, the tekelet blue. That was how she was healed. Christ turned around and said, your faith has healed you because she didn't even touch his person. And that's because she touched the blue that represented God. This is the secret which was lost to the Jewish people themselves. One woman knew about it. She came from a rabbinical family. Her name was Sonia Green. She was Ukrainian. As a Jewish person in Ukraine, because of the Holodomor and what the Bolsheviks had done, the Ukrainians would have killed her. She escaped to the United States, married H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft needed what the gays call a beard to pretend he wasn't gay. He married Sonia Green and she told him about the new Jewish obsession. The idea that they had that the real source of the Teklit Blue was a cuttlefish, a squid. Now, this squid produces the kind of blue dye that was later infamous for being found on the walls of the gas chambers. When the gas chambers unleashed their lethal gas, it left the trace on the walls that was called Prussian blue. This is ultimately what became of this new Zionist interpretation of the source of the Tekelet blue. H.P. Lovecraft was a distant descendant of Abdul al Hazred a man known as the Mad Arab, one of the greatest scientists in Muslim history, a man who pretended to be mad so the caliph would not have him executed because of his failure to dam the Nile, which he knew that the even the great advancements of the Muslim world didn't have the technology to do during his lifetime. When his distant descendants migrated to America, their name was Hazard, as in red, or danger. And that later on was changed to Lovecraft. But because of Lovecraft's background and his understanding of Cthulhu, who is in the Quran as the great abandoner, Cthulhu is al Shaitan. Cthulhu is Satan. He understood the cuttlefish to be the image of Shaitan, Satan himself. That's why Lovecraft tried to warn the world. He also warned the world in his stories that the elder sign that kept the anti-gods at bay was the Hockenkreuz, the hooked cross, the swastika. He expounds upon this in he, the only novella to ever go into publication in his lifetime, The Shadow Over Innsmouth. 
As a fiction author, he was trying to expose to people the realities of the cults of the anti-gods, the Edomites, the Herodian insurgency, the Cthuloid, Contra religion. And this was, of course, known in both the Islamic and Judaic traditions. That's why I said Judeo-Islam is a far more sensible synthesis than the concept of Judeo-Christianity. Lovecraft had converted to Islam as a very young man. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah. Okay, I'll go oh, on. Oh, I didn't say anything. Okay, yeah. I'm going so to I'll go. to wrap up soon because I just noticed my son wants me to drive him somewhere. Oh, yes. So what I can say then is that um, Lovecraft tried to expose the anti-gods, the Edomites, and of course the symbol of Cthulhuism, and for that, he was ultimately assassinated. Uh, he worked with, originally, the great Houdini, Houdini himself being Jewish, and Houdini was going to write a book with H.P. Lovecraft about this very issue to expose Zionism as Edomite, Herodian, and truly anti-Jewish, or antithetical to true Judaism, and that's when Harry Houdini was murdered by a hitman with a criminal record. Then Lovecraft himself was contracted by Charles Augustus Lindbergh, who wanted to run for president, who was financially backed by Henry Ford. The only thing Charles Augustus Lindbergh was missing was an American Mein Kampf. Lovecraft was hired to write that, and then he was murdered. Injected with cancer by Dr. Cornelius Rhodes, the man who had perfected weaponized cancer by killing many Puerto Ricans. And he was quite open and proud about that, how many Puerto Ricans he had killed with cancer. But he never faced any justice for his crimes. This is something we're exposing in the next book. Peter Moon and I are writing together. But now you have the background of the anti-gods the Nazis were fighting against, the fact that their swastika was a ward, a shield against that very uh, force of anti-godliness, the Edomites, the Herodian insurgency. And as for Hitler's admiration of the Japanese, he understood through what my mother explained to him that the Japanese and the Chinese were ultimately both to be admired cultures and his friends. And she explained, of course, that uh, when the Jewish kingdoms were sundered, the Jewish people escaped to Japan. Now, this is a fact because the Japanese shield, the regalia of the imperial Yamato dynasty is the same as the Star of David, the shield of David on their imperial regalia at the Yamato dynasty's inner sanctum levels. As well as that fact, they experienced an incredible Bronze Age revolution when the Jewish culture arrived on the shores of Japan. That's when the people of Japan developed a Jewish minority that they have always honored and respected. And these people, and many words in Japanese are identical to that of Hebrew. Uh, these are the people who helped acculturate Japan. This is what Hitler felt were the true heirs of the Jewish tradition of the Davidian line. And that's why he sided with the Japanese. And this is why the Americans, infested as they are with Herodian Edomite Satanism, wanted to exterminate the Japanese. This is what put the Americans on a purely satanic agenda to exterminate the true heirs of Jewish civilization in Japan. And of course, that's why Hitler was against them and why Hitler declared war on the United States, not the other way around. So hopefully all that puts in context. We can cover this again uh, uh, next time we speak. And uh, I'm glad we were able to cover the basics. Obviously, that's too general. We can go into the specifics next time we speak. But uh, we certainly covered a lot of basics that hopefully will help. Yes, brilliant. Thank you so much. And I'm sure um, that will be very helpful to, to the producers um for, for the show and um, thank you very much and um i'll speak soon douglas thank you i look forward to it blessed be and um i'll do my best to try and 
download this and get you a copy. I know you're working on recording on your side as well, and hopefully together we'll make certain we both got what we need. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much, Douglas. I'll speak to you later on. Thank you. Look, Bye. Bye for now.